Hi, I'm Dr. Van der Vakorska, and this is Inequality Bites. And this is poetry redefined, focus from the left behind, nobles of a different kind, need to make the state of mind, look how fast the minds are getting sent down for time, take a look at our strengths all combined. This is Inequality Bites, the podcast where we discuss how we can make society more equal so that everyone can flourish. In this series, we'll speak not only to experts on a range of different inequalities, but vitally also to those at the sharp end of inequality. Inequality Bites is created by the Equality Trust, the charity working to improve quality of life in the UK by reducing social and economic inequality, because more equal societies are better for us all. The UK is one of the most unequal countries in the developed world. In 2019, analysis by the Equality Trust found that the UK's five richest families own more wealth than 13 million people. Meanwhile, every day on the news and in our communities, we're seeing record numbers of people using food banks and the number of rough sleepers on the rise. Today, we're speaking to Professor Kate Pickett, Professor of Epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York. Kate's a Global Ambassador for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, a Fellow of the UK Faculty of Public Health, a Co-Founder and Trustee of the Equality Trust, and Co-Author, along with Professor Richard Wilkinson, of the best-selling books, The Spirit Level and The Inner Level. And I'm delighted to welcome her because she is also the chair of the Equality Trust. So hi, Kate. Welcome to the first Inequality Bites. And thank you for joining us today. Hi, Vonda. It's nice to join you. So can you tell us a bit about your background, where you're from and how, where you grew up? Well, I was born in Somerset in the UK, but I grew up in Derbyshire. And that's where I went to school. And then I couldn't really decide what I wanted to be when I grew up. I originally thought I wanted to be an art historian. And I went to university with the intention of studying that. But they wouldn't let me do it in the first year. So I thought I'd do something similar. And I started to study archaeology and anthropology. And I fell in love with what's called biological anthropology, which is sort of, you know, the biology of humans as a species and how we adapt. And then I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. So I thought I'd do something practical. And I became a nutritional scientist and went to America to train. And I thought I would work in low and middle income countries. I wanted to save the world from starvation and feed hungry babies. And that's what I thought I would spend my life doing. And I thought I wasn't particularly interested in sort of health problems in rich countries. It took me a while to realise that all of the problems that I had associated with living in a poor country were right there on my doorstep in America. And in fact, they were right on the doorstep back home in the UK as well. So obviously you were exposed to a great deal of inequality, but is, was there a personal situation or circumstance which really brought inequality home for you? I think inequality impinges on us all of the time. You notice it in different ways. I mean, I remember noticing at school, some people had more resources, access to to things I didn't have. Again, at university, suddenly I saw much bigger differences in, in wealth and income. I think, I think if you live in an unequal society, you're aware of social status differences, income and wealth differences all the time, and they make themselves felt in different ways. Yeah, I can definitely identify with that. I mean, I, I was from a working class background and went to a private girls school and I could see mm. the absolute difference. That was such an education for me and seeing how differently, how so differently people lived. Um, and not just that material difference, but the confidence that, that people have as well. Yeah, I mean, I thought there were some posh people at my school, but I'd got no idea, really. You know, and I was lucky enough to go to Cambridge University and so saw some quite, quite more extreme examples of wealth and confidence there than, than I could have ever anticipated. Yeah, I think it, it sort of seeps into our souls, doesn't it? And we, we, we can feel it. We can't see it, but we can feel it and we know it's innately wrong. So, you know, what drove you to do the work that you did, that first interest and in realising that inequality was everywhere? Well, I think partly a sense of social justice. You know, I was brought up in a family that espoused those, those values. I think we were expected to grow up and do something useful with our lives. And I think once you've noticed those injustices around you, it's, it's quite hard to sort of put them aside and not do something. Working in America and, and, and uncovering inequalities in income and wealth, but also ethnic inequalities in the US and how they were shaping health was a real driver. And I think that's an area where people most readily identify with inequality, isn't it? Looking at health and the social determinants. 
And I think, you know, that just brings us on fantastically to talking about the spirit level. It's over a decade now since you and Richard published that book. And not only did you bring the research together, but you also set up an organisation, the Equality Trust, to, to campaign on that. What do you think the key findings of the spirit level are that are really relevant to now? Well, there are three. And the three main findings in the spirit level, the first is that inequalities of of income, so the gap between rich and poor in a society, affects a really wide range of different kinds of outcomes. So it affects health, things like life expectancy, infant mortality, mental illness and obesity. It affects children's life chances, so how well they do in school, the likelihood that young women become teenage mothers, social mobility, but it also affects relationships between people in society. So the social fabric, levels of trust, homicide rates, levels of imprisonment. So a wide range of things all seem to be affected by inequality. And that was a bit of a surprise because most academics, we work in silos, you know, so epidemiologists study health, criminologists study violence, and, and often they don't meet. So, so I think that was new to a lot of people, the idea that inequality might be a root cause of so many things. The second thing was that the differences between different societies were so large. So in more unequal societies, there's three times more cases of mental illness among the population in a year compared to the more equal ones. For teenage birth rates, eight times more of those in more unequal countries compared to more equal ones. And the difference is even bigger for things like imprisonment. So really big differences between different countries in what proportion of the population are suffering from those different health and social problems. And that is a clue to the third point, which is that it isn't just the poor who are affected by inequality. We wouldn't have such big differences if only the poor were affected. It seems to be a robust finding now that people do better in more equal societies, whether or not they are poor or affluent. The differences are biggest at the bottom of society for the poorest, but the effects of inequality creep all the way up society. So that if you and I, educated, fairly affluent people, were in a more equal society, but with the same level of education and income that we have, our chances that we would be healthy and happy and that our children would be doing well would be greater than they are for us here in the very unequal UK. And I think that's really fascinating because we tend to look at these areas in terms of the sharp end of inequality. How can we really convince richer people and those with more power that actually this does affect everybody? It's not just about those at the sharp end. Ah, well, that's a big question, isn't it? And if I, if I knew the answer to that one, I would have done it. But I think I used to think that if we could just show people in power that their lives and the lives of their children and their neighbours and their family and friends, their life chances would be better in a more equal society, that that would be enough to convince them that they should do something about inequality. I think that was very naive of me. We have shown that and it hasn't really shifted their tendency to want to sort of protect their vested interests in a very unequal society. I think partly it takes time. It takes time for new ideas to spread. I think it takes a grassroots movement of people demanding change. I think the global financial crisis sharpened people's awareness of inequalities and the damage that they can do. I remember the MPs' expenses scandal in the UK highlighted for a lot of of people differences that they hadn't been aware were there and that they felt were unjust. And it takes a while for these ideas to percolate through public consciousness, I think, and so people start demanding change. I mean, sadly, the current coronavirus pandemic has highlighted all of the inequalities that the Equality Trust was set up to, to, to fight against has brought those into sharp focus. And so although this is a terrible time of suffering and and harm for many people, it might also offer us an opportunity for working for more positive change because we can see that our lack of resilience and our high levels of inequality, our low level of public services, our low level of pay 
for key workers within the NHS and, and in other sectors. Those exposed us to more harm and suffering than if we had been a more equal, a more resilient, a higher paid, a more egalitarian society. We may have more chance to speak truth to power at this moment than we have had for a while, but we could do with some inspired leadership as well. The spirit level has obviously stood the test of time. We get very enthusiastic people talking about it, tweeting about it and coming to it over the last 10 years and particularly over the last year as well. Do you think that's connected to the fact that we are talking more about inequality at the moment, that coronavirus has shown us that inequality is at the heart of the problem? Yes, I do. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? We we wrote that book in the hope that people would read it and, um, and that the ideas in it w- would get out. I think it took us by surprise how much that came to be the case and that people continued to read it over the past 10 years. So they continue to write to us, um, people who've just come across it, people who are discovering its meaning for them or its relevance for their lives or their institutions they work in or their countries. I think the current pandemic has heightened that. But interestingly, I think over the past decade, inequality has become a serious issue on the political stage, locally, in places throughout Britain, nationally and internationally as well. And I don't think we can go back from that. I think inequality as a political issue is here to stay at all those levels. And I think it's a, a testimony to to the book and to your work with Richard as well, that you know you have been all over the globe, quite literally talking to various governments about inequality and, and what can be done. And we'll, we'll talk about that later in the podcast. But I'd like to look at how unequal the UK is today and how you've seen this change over the last 10 years since the book was released? The main story about inequality in the UK isn't a contemporary one. The main story about why we are as unequal as we are is a 1980s story. It's a 1979-1980 onset of a vast increase in inequality under Thatcher that was a sort of intentional collateral of her neoliberal economic policy. Inequality was seen as unfortunate, but probably didn't matter that much because trickle down would make us all better off. And and if we, you know, unleashed those free market forces, everything would, would improve. Now, we were sold a pup on that one. Trickle down never happened. But since then, subsequent governments have not really addressed that huge rise in inequality that took place through the 1980s. Inequality has wobbled along, really. It's gone up a little bit, gone down a little bit, up a little bit, down a little bit. Although consistently, the very rich get richer. What we see now is a willingness to perhaps tackle that that has not been there in those long decades since. So perhaps a willingness to change on the back of us having to think about the consequences of inequality during the pandemic and as we come out of the pandemic, we hope. So I, th- I think we are, we're ready for a new story around inequality. The story of the last 10 years has been one of austerity, and that has clearly had a major impact on public health, on public well-being, on the social fabric. So if we combine that 1980s massive rise in inequality that's never been undone with a decade of austerity politics that have undermined our social security net, our basic provision of services, we couldn't really have been in a worse place at the beginning of 2020 when we were hit by this, you know, sudden external shock. And yet there are people and, you know, I come across this quite often, as I'm sure you do, who would say that, you know, we need inequality. Inequality is a driver. It really motivates people. What would be your answer to that? That's tosh, really. Um, There's absolutely no evidence to suggest that that is the case. So, yeah, I've heard that too, and and you'll probably continue to hear it. There's no evidence that inequality increases aspirations, makes people work harder. They might work longer hours in more unequal societies, but they're tending to do that at great cost to themselves and because they're struggling to keep up rather than out of any sort of aspiration. Children's life chances are worse in more unequal societies. Creativity appears to be lower. There are fewer patents granted per head of population. So it doesn't seem to inspire aspiration and social mobility. It doesn't seem to inspire creativity. And in fact, we just see a huge waste of human talent and human potential 
in more unequal societies. I think there's there's no robust evidence or basis for making those sorts of claims. Quite the opposite. The evidence suggests that greater equality will actually foster more of those things, more social mobility, more creativity, more aspiration. Thanks for listening to Inequality Bites. If you're enjoying today's podcast, would you consider donating the cost of a cup of coffee or lunch to the Equality Trust? This will help us to support young people to speak truth to power, to campaign on key issues like fair and equal pay, and to produce more online content like this podcast to raise awareness of the damage that inequality causes and how we can reduce this, because inequality is not inevitable. We understand that not everyone can donate, so if you can't, then please visit our website to sign up to our mailing list, take action on our latest campaigns, and follow us on social media. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the rest of the podcast. In your vast experience of advising governments and administrations, how have other countries tackled inequality, and have, has this been effective? Well, internationally, the, the picture is quite complex. If we look historically, we can see countries that have made major changes, either getting a lot more equal or a lot more unequal. And we can look at the impact that that has had on health and well-being. And we can look at what, what sorts of policies were chosen to do that. So, for example, the United States used to be a lot more equal than it is now. It had the same sort of neoliberal drive that we had in the 80s that drove levels of inequality up. And it lost its position as a world leader in population, health and well-being. Japan, on the other hand, used to be a very unequal country. And then after the Second World War became rapidly more equal and saw very rapid improvements in its health and well-being. So it moved up the international league table. At the moment, well, in the recent past, the only region of the world that was making great strides in becoming more equal well, many of the Latin American countries, and in many of those, that that's stopped now. In most European countries, most have been getting a bit more unequal, some a bit faster than others over, say, the past decade, but, but not vast changes. I think what we see across the world are places, and sometimes these are countries, sometimes they're states or, or large city areas, where innovative, progressive leaders do things to try and improve inequality to try and to make their society more equal. So we can look at a country like Bhutan, which has replaced the pursuit of gross domestic product growth with the pursuit of gross national happiness. We can look at other societies that have put well-being at the forefront of their societal goals. We can look at countries that have tried to make environmental shifts towards sustainable e- economies. We can look at communities that have tried to do community wealth building and try and keep investment and procurement local. We can look at places that have imposed living wages. We can look at institutions as well as cities and and, and nations. So I think we can pick up a lot of good ideas from across the world, but we've just not yet seen anywhere that's willing to put all of those different solutions, all of those different mechanisms into one package and really push for deep progress on reducing inequality. So of all the places that you've researched or visited, is there one place that you would choose to live in as the sort of most equal place? There are a lot of places that are very attractive to live in because they are more equal, they feel more egalitarian. And when, and when you're there, you, you sense that stronger sense of trust and community, that stronger sense of well-being. I often feel in in Scandinavia, but also in the Netherlands, that strong sense of being in a place where well-being is more important than wealth. I think New Zealand felt like that to me also. But I don't want to live anywhere other than where I live. I actually want to live here and make the UK a better place. So on that note, um, with your commitment to making the UK a better place, obviously the government has committed, as many other governments have, to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and goal number 10 is reducing inequality. So if you could ask the government to do one thing to reduce inequality, what do you think would have the most immediate impact? I think the most immediate impact would be to make taxation progressive, a lot more progressive, 
that would be the fastest, swiftest way towards greater equality. I would like to see a wealth tax and a land tax, for instance, and a larger inheritance tax and a much, much more progressive income tax. But the reason that Richard and I have thought a lot and written a lot in recent years about economic democracy is because we worry that those kinds of quick solutions are less resilient to a change in government. So we could get a very progressive government voted in at the next election. They might put in a wonderful tax regime that we would all feel was was really helpful and was going to make society more equal. And then four, five years later, we might get a change of government and it will be unpicked again. And so we've been thinking much more about robust embedding of greater equality in institutions and in workplaces through the promotion of economic democracy as a way of achieving more lasting and long-term resilient change. What would you recommend at a local level? What approaches can be taken at a local level? Because we see now that you know, local councils, devolved administrations have far more power locally. Well, and I think at the moment, local areas have more devolved authority than they used to have, but less cash. So they are cash strapped, despite having the, perhaps the power and the authority to do more than that they would have been able to do previously. I think local authorities, city councils, local government can play a really strong exemplar role, actually, in their local economies through their own practices of hiring, of pay, of procurement, of establishing a sense that they are a community that is promoting greater equality and that they expect other institutions in their environment to work with them in that way. So they have quite limited powers around things like changing council tax bans, for instance, but they can set a really good example by requiring everybody from whom they procure services to pay the living wage to their employees. So I think there are lots of solutions for local government. Mm. The strongest thing they can do is really listen to their communities and find out what it is that their communities, that the people that they are serving want to see change in their lives. And they've got more potential to do that because they are local. So we've seen a number of fairness commissions in different places throughout the UK where that has happened. We've seen poverty truth commissions taking place where people in power are actually listening to the voices of those who are poor. And I think that local connection is is probably a hopeful way in which local government can, can move forward with an equality agenda. And very often when we're talking to local authorities or, or councils or or politicians, you know, they'll point out that, that they're really bothered about poverty. They're really concerned about people at the sharp end. But they're, as you know, Mandelson had said, intensely relaxed about the rich. What would you say in answer to that? I think it's the same problem that, that you raised earlier when thinking about, well, Perhaps the people at the top have earned their privilege by by being creative, by working hard, by by being better be- beings than than the rest of us. I don't think it's any different at local level than it is at, at national level. And I think they should be working with wealth creators in their communities to think about more socially just distribution of wealth and opportunities in their communities and just as I would hope this would happen nationally and internationally getting those of us who are privileged to use our privilege for positive change. So at this point in the podcast we like to ask our guests for practical things listeners can do today this week or this year to personally have an impact on inequality so what would you recommend somebody could do listening to this podcast could go off and do right now or might want to do next week, or do longer term? Well, today, I think if you haven't, you should check out the Equality Trust website. I think you should think about signing up to to receive information. I think you could start exploring the resources that are offered by the Equality Trust and educate yourself. So that's something you could do today. In the next week or so, you could think about talking to your family, your friends, your colleagues, about how these issues affect them and your workplace and your community and become a voice for change in those places, in your family, among your friends, in your workplace, in your neighbourhood. Next year, 
or sort of more long term. I think think about real engagement politically. Who are you going to vote for? How can you help other people think about who they vote for? How can you hold local and national politicians to account? Can you write to your MP when the government is pursuing policies that don't seem to be moving our country in the right direction? Can you write to your local newspaper? It's a little bit like we all ask ourselves all the time, what can we do to help with the climate emergency? And it often feels, you know, as if it's it's a drop in the ocean to ride your bike to the shops instead of getting in your car or not to fly on holiday or turn your taps off or the lights out and not use plastic and, and, and things like that. But those things, they do add up. But as much as anything, living the life that, that we wish everybody to live, being active in the ways where we can affect change, I think it's good to to have those examples. But the final thing is, is that the reason inequality has such invidious effects on us all is how it makes us feel in relation to other people. It's to do with issues of superiority and inferiority and respect and disrespect. And one thing that we can all do all the time, actually, today, tomorrow, next week and next year, is to treat one another with the same respect and consideration and empathy that we would want others to respond to us. And that is a a sort of individual thing we can do that if we all do it collectively, actually really does change the way people interact in the society we live in. Kate, thank you so much for joining us for our first episode. Thanks for listening to Inequality Bites, the podcast exploring not just the damage that inequality is causing, but also the solutions so that we can create a more equal society that's better for everyone. So if you want to help us tackle inequality, then check out the Equality Trust website, as Kate suggested, and also get your hands on a copy of The Spirit Level. We also run local groups, so you can see if there's a local group in your area. And if there isn't a local group in your area, then contact us and we'll help you set one up. And you can also follow us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. In our next episode, I'll be speaking to Professor Richard Wilkinson, talking about his and Kate's most recent book, The Inner Level how more equal societies reduce stress, restore sanity, and improve everybody's well-being. Richard will be exploring how inequality gets under our skin and damages our mental health. Inequality has psychological effects. It goes through the mind. It does something to how we behave. If you live in a society where some people are hugely important and others are seen as really worthless at the bottom, we all become more worried about how we are seen and judged. It undermines our own sense of self-worth. Let us know what you thought on Twitter. Subscribe, like and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Acast or whatever platform you're listening on. And tell your friends. See you next time for Inequality Bites.